Are you ready? Here we go. Now, we are in Acts chapter, or Act 2, which starts with chapter 2, verse 8, and goes through chapter 3, verse 5. Here's the shepherd is calling, but here she is. She is sleeping. She is sound asleep. How many of you know we all love to sleep? But there was a mistranslation in your King James Bible. I'll go back to that. In Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 7, the bridegroom is speaking to the daughters of Jerusalem, and it says, by the rose, or by the hinds of the field, stir not up nor awake my love until she please. Most Bibles say he please. Uh, but the Young's literal translation says, she please. And when you know Hebrew, you realize she's the one who fell asleep. And when you know English, you see that's common sense with the next verses. But she's the one who fell asleep. How many of you realize the church also has been asleep for a long time? So now the Shulamite, the bride, is waking up. And look at what she says. In the Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, she goes, well, it's the voice of my beloved. Remember, he always calls her my love. She always calls him my beloved. And she says, the voice of my beloved, behold, he is coming, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. <gasps> behold. He's now standing right behind our wall. He's looking in the windows. Oh, he's showing himself through the lattice. He's getting closer. So here we see he's like a young buck. And here he is. He's looking through the lattice. Okay. And what is he doing? He's coming. He's coming. Let's watch. <clears throat> now the shepherd is speaking and he says to her, Hey, honey, <laughs> the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. You didn't sleep one night. You went into hibernation. <laughs> this isn't someone who slept one night. You slept all winter. You've missed the rain. You've missed the blessings. Okay, he says, look, the flower is over and gone. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. Okay, again, we have to stop and think. What time of year is this? Which is Passover. He's, these are tied into the festivals. And my goodness, she missed all of the winter rains. As a matter of fact, the rains always speak of blessings. Look at Ezekiel 34, 26. God says, I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. I will send down the showers in their season and they will be showers of blessing. So the rain always speaks of blessing. Okay, now. Let me see. Okay, I'm going to skip a verse. We're going to come back to that. Oh, here, here I am. Let me go back up here a second. Okay. Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Here she says, Behold, he's standing behind our wall. Do you know what the Hebrew word for wall is? This is called the Western Wall. It's called the Kotel. And the Kotel is what they call the Western Wall. And that's the word here. Okay. <clears throat> and the rains, just like you see here, I don't know if you can see it very well, but the rains always speak of blessings. Now, look what he says in Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 10. It says, My beloved spoke and said to me, What? Get up! So who was sleeping? She was. This is why you see the King James translation is completely wrong because she's the one who was sleeping. And he says, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And then he says, okay, 
the winter's past, the rain is over and gone. Now take a look at this. This is actual rain in Israel. All the rain comes in January, February, March, and this is what she's missed. She's waking up around Passover. Now you'll notice the rains, Israel's a desert. The latitude is the same as Scottsdale, Phoenix, Arizona, okay? And here's where the rains begin at Sukkot. They always pray for rain and the rains begin to increase. But the big rains, he just got done saying, you've missed all the rains. You missed it. You missed all of the blessings. And then look at Jeremiah 8, 7. Even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times. And the turtle dove, the swallow, the crane, keep the time of their coming. But my people are clueless. Okay, the birds know when to migrate. The butterflies know when to migrate. The whales know when to migrate. Okay, the salmon know when to migrate. But he's saying the appointed times, the Moedim, Passover, Sukkot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. He says, but my people don't know the appointed times. He says, look, even the stork knows when it's time. All right? They know the appointed times. Now, look at this. In chapter 2, verse 13, what is he telling her? The fig tree puts forth her green figs. The vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. So we see again, she is the one who was sleeping. But look at this in Proverbs 10, verse 5. Whoever gathers in summer is a wise son, but he that sleeps and harvest is a son that causes shame. And I believe much of the church does it. They say they're supposed to know the times and the seasons, but they don't know the times and the seasons. Most of them don't realize this is the month of repentance. Every month has its own time and season. And one of these days, I'll put out a a little pamphlet that says every month what the time and what the season is for that month. But look at Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 14. What is he saying? He calls her a dove, and he says, Oh, my dove, you that are in the cleft of the rock. So I got a little dove here in the clefts of a rock, in the secret places of the stairs. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice for sweet is your voice and your countenance is comely. Do you realize what is happening in this chapter? She goes, I hear him coming, his voice skipping among the mountains. Oh, he's close. He's looking through the window now. So I need to go run and hide so he won't see me and put me to work. (laughs) That's why she's hiding in the secret places of the stairs. She saw him coming and goes, I'm out of here. So she is hiding. Here she is, hiding. He's looking in through the lattice. Where are you, dear? Oh, and she's hiding behind the stairs. Oh, no, he's going to put me to work. And so look at this. Here we see now. I think it's, um, oh, oh, I went the wrong way. Okay, so here now, look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Here comes the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the evening wind. And the man and his wife went where? A secret place. They went into hiding, okay, from uh, the voice of the Lord. They're hiding in the trees away from the eyes of the Lord. And the voice of the Lord comes to sing, where are you? As if he doesn't know. Okay. Look at this. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 20 and 24, the anger of the Lord will not return until he has executed and he has performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you're going to consider it perfectly. We're living in the latter days, and we're going to consider perfectly what the thoughts of the Lord's heart are. And it says, I haven't sent any of these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they're prophesying. 
If they had just stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned from their evil way and from their evil doings. Am I a God at hand, says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide themselves in secret places that I won't see them, saith the Lord? Don't I fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? So here, just like in Genesis, the body of Messiah doesn't want to go to work and they're hiding in secret places. And God says, I still see you. <laughs> now, we know Israel is the vine. Isaiah 5 talks all about that. And in Psalms 80, look at verse 9, 8 and 9. It says, you took a vine out of Egypt. That's Israel. You drove out the nations and you planted it in their own land. You made ready a place for it that it might take deep root and it sent out its branches over all the land. So that's what God did. Just like Adam was not created from in the garden, he was created outside of the garden and then put in the garden. Here we have Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, and he takes the vine out of Egypt and then he plants it into the promised land for them to spread out. Now, look at Psalm 80. It continues to say in verse 14 and 15, come back, O God of armies from heaven. Wow. Let your eyes be turned to this particular vine and give your mind to it even to the tree which was planted by your right hand and to the branch which you made strong for yourself. So the whole thing is the vine has to cooperate with the vine dresser. Now, listen to what the shepherd says. Here, now picture it, he's outside of the house. Okay, the bride represents the church or Israel, whatever you want to think, but she doesn't want to do the work. She wants to stay within the four walls, okay? And she's hiding from him. And so he says, here's what we need to do. Look at this picture. I love this little picture. And he says this. We need to take the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. It's just, it's just like a, they're just being born. They're tender. They're small. Now, when the Bible says this, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, what does that mean? See, most people read it and, and they say, oh, it's a nice little story. The, don't let the fox spoil the vine. Okay, well, here is when you let Scripture interpret itself instead of you trying to come up with some ridiculous allegory. Who is the vine? Okay. A fox is destroying the vine that God wants to take care of. Look at Ezekiel 13, verse 3 and 4. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit. They see nothing. O Israel, your prophets are the foxes in the deserts. What is spoiling Israel? It's the false prophets. They, let the Bible tell you, the false prophet are the foxes that are spoiling the nation of Israel. Do you see how easy it is to let it interpret when it interprets itself? As a matter of fact, look at Jeremiah 23, 25 through 28. God says, I've heard what these prophets have said. And they, look at this, they prophesy lies where? Wow, remember what we just read earlier in the Gospels? They're prophesying in his name, but they're prophesying lies. They're prophesying what comes out of their own heart. They're not prophesying what he told them to prophesy. This is why it's called wicked works. I wanted to wait for this time to tell you about that. But do you understand? The Lord's prophets are prophesying lies. They're not prophesying what he told them to say. And this is why the body of Messiah, even today, is having problems. It says, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name. They want their name to be known. They forget God's name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. And this is the problem that's going on in the body of Messiah today. Okay, now, many of you are familiar with this next phrase. Now the Shulamite is responding. Now remember, 
Here he comes. He's all excited. He's heard he's coming. He's looking through the wall and she goes and runs behind the stairs and he says, hey, come out. I want to see you. I want to hear your voice. So what does he finally get to hear her say? She finally speaks and she goes, my beloved is mine and I am his. In other words, you belong to me before I belong to you. My beloved is mine. Oh, and then I'm his. And you're going to see this phrase evolve throughout the chapter as she, or throughout the book as she matures. And she's so proud of herself. She goes, he feeds among the lilies. If you remember in chapter one, she says, where do you feed your flock? I have a clue. I'm clueless. But now she's learned a little bit about him. So she thinks she's got it down. I know he's feeding among the lilies. And then look at what she says. Go away or turn, my beloved, and be like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. Bether means separation, just like the Cascades separate eastern Washington from western Washington. <clears throat> so I've, I've got here this <clears throat> beautiful little field in the mountains, and I want you to think of the mountains as being a separation from one side to the other. And if you look here, let me, oh, nope, go back. Nope, go back, go back, back. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, yep, yeah, I'm right here. Okay, there. Here's Jerusalem up here in the corner. The mountains of Bether or Betar, here is the Betar Alit, here is Betar. And so there's Jerusalem. But look at this. The mountains here is what separates east from west. And this is exactly where the 1949 Armistice Agreement line was, separating, you know, Palestine from Israel. But the mountains of Betar means mountains of separation. So what she is saying, oh, my beloved, why don't you go take a hike? Why don't you go be strong? You go be this really cool shepherd. Why don't you go run to the other side? Uh, I personally, I need to get some more sleep. So you go take a hike. I'm going to sit here and rest. You go do what you need to do. Okay. So what do we see happens? She's saying, you do your thing. I want to stay within the four walls of the church or the temple or whatever. She claims to be in the driver's seat in this relationship. She has little knowledge of him, but like I said, she remembers from Song of Songs, chapter one, verse seven, when she says, tell me, O who my soul loves, where you feed, where you make your flock to rest at noon. Here she claims to love him, doesn't know where he works, and she only wants to know when the flocks are at rest, so she wants to come at lunchtime. She doesn't want to help with the work, okay? In other words, she thinks, Oh, look, I know where you feed. Uh, if I need you, I'll call you. I'll text you. Okay, hon? You know, oh, shepherd boy, I need you now. It's all about me. Okay, I know where you feed now, so I'm safe in the walls. You go do whatever you need to do. All right, <clears throat> so look at what the Shulamite now says. He leaves just like she wanted. And she says, by night on my bed... I sought him, whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I found him not. Okay, let's stop for a minute. If you remember last week, it was, look, our rafters are fur. Our cedars, you know, uh, our, I mean, our uh, houses of cedar, our rafters are a fur, and our bed is green. It's now my bed, my house, my cedars. It's, it's on my bed. You know, I can just see her looking for him. She's searching everywhere. Where'd he go? Where'd he go? You know, she's got her hand out. Well, he's gone. She thought that he would come back, you know, and it's all good. She could have been out all night working with him, being with her beloved. Instead, now she's home alone. And look what it says. I went to look for him. I couldn't find him. So she says, okay, I'll get up now. And I'll go about the city and the streets, and in the broad ways, I will seek him. Does that ring a bell? The broad ways. Broad is the way of destruction. She's totally looking in all the wrong places. 
And he says, I will seek whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I found him not. Th several times she looks for him, but she can't find him. She claims to love him, but she wants nothing to do with him. She wants to be the one that tells him where to go, tells him what to do, and she just wants to rest. I can just see her searching under the covers. Is he there? Where did he go? And so she could have been with the shepherd had she listened to his voice, but now she's searching at night in the dark. And guess what? That's where predators are looking, lurking. Okay, so let's look at Hosea. Hosea is one of the main books that tie in to the Song of Songs. And in Hosea chapter 5, verse 5 and 6, it says, The pride of Israel testifies to their face. Therefore shall Israel and Ephraim fall in their iniquity. Judah is going to fall with them, and they will go with their flocks and their herds to seek the Lord, but they shall not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them. So many believers think they can forget God, and then when they need him, he'll appear. But guess what? They think when they call God, he will come. That is only based if when he calls and you come. God is calling, and the speed with which we answer his call is the same speed he'll answer when we call. And here, they have their flocks, they have their herds, and they're searching for him, and he can't find it. This is why Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. This is why we have the biblical calendar that starts this Rosh Hashanah, so you know the appointed times. There literally are times when he is not near. So you have to call upon him when he is near. And guess what? We're in the month of Elul. This is when he's near. He's in the field. So literally, this is why you need to be on God's calendar that we produce so that you know what time it is. Look at Jeremiah. This is chapter 29, verse 12 and 14. Then you will call upon me. You're going to go and you're even going to pray to me and I will hearken to you and you're going to seek me and you're going to find me when? When you search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, says the Lord. I will turn away your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations, from all the places that I've driven you, says the Lord. I will bring you again to the place where I've caused you to be carried away captive. That's Jerusalem. That's what's happened the last 2,000 years. And this prophecy was fulfilled. They've all been brought back. But the key is we have to seek the Lord with all of our heart. How often do we want something if someone else will get it for us? <laughs> we don't want to get up and get it. Hey, but would you get that for me? Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 15. The Lord is with you if you're with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he's going to forsake you. Now, for a long season, Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest, without the Torah. But when they in their trouble did turn to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. Do you realize that's a prophecy right now? It's been 2,000 years that they've been without the teaching priest, without the Torah, without the true God. They've come back as a nation, and now they're starting to turn back to him. Ezekiel says they'll come back to him as... Uh, the heathen, basically, or in unbelief, which is what happened in 48. They were mostly communist Zionists. Uh, but now God is beginning to turn their hearts. Now, here, the Shulamite is speaking. And look what she says. The watchmen that go about the city found me, to whom I said, have you seen whom my soul loves? And then what happens? Immediately after... She says she loves him to someone else. She's not just speaking to herself. She's now out in the open. She says, it was but a little while that I passed from them, but I found him whom my soul loves. Why? Because he's finally confessing him to others. And she finds him. And she says, so I held him and I wouldn't let him go until I brought him to mom's house into the chamber of her that conceived me. So the moment she publicly professes her love for the shepherd, she finds him. But what happens? She goes back to sleep. <laughs> Look at 
song of Solomon 3, 5. Again, the shepherd says, this is, she's exhausted after her all night search. And the shepherd says, I charge you, daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose, by the hinds of the field, do not stir up nor awake my love until she please. Now the King James says he please, but it's wrong. So we are now entering, drum roll, brum, 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 act chapter three, which is chapter three, verse six to chapter five, verse two. Her search begins again and she falls asleep again. So what do we find here? The daughters of Jerusalem are now speaking in verse six. I got a little picture here. Here's the daughters of Jerusalem and they see this huge parade in the middle of the night going on and look at what the daughters of Jerusalem say. Who is this that comes out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke? Now notice it's not a cloud. This is smoke that burns the eyes, that burn the ears. It wasn't the pillar of cloud like the Messiah had in the desert. And it says perfumed with myrrh and frankincense and all the powders of the merchant. This is at night. This is King Solomon on the hunt for prey. He's not feeding the sheep. He is feeding on the sheep. Watch what happens. Solomon is coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke. The Hebrew word here for smoke is ashan, and it implies anger. The phrase pillars of smoke is the same phrase we find in Joel chapter 2, verse 30. God says, I will show wonders in the heavens, in the earth, blood and fire, and pillars of smoke. This isn't like the cloud in the desert. This is fury. This is anger. Look at Psalms 74, verse 1. Oh God, why have you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? So we are not to equate the pillar of smoke here with the pillar of cloud in Exodus. It's a completely different phrase and word. Uh, we see in Exodus 13, 22, he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night from his people. So what do we see here? Solomon is smoking mad because the bride has left him and is returned to the, and she's with the shepherd. All right. Now. Look what the daughters of Jerusalem say. Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. And there are 60 men of war about it of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man has his sword upon his thigh because of fear in the night. Solomon is putting all of them in jeopardy because Simon or Solomon is a man of the night. He's a man of darkness. Okay, he's a predator. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5. You are all children of light and the children of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So here Solomon is putting his own men in danger. They're in fear just to fulfill his own desires. Okay? How many of you know, and you read it in uh, Judges and different stories, there are lions and bears out there. But Solomon does not love Jerusalem. He loves the daughters of Jerusalem, and they're seeing if any of the daughters are daughters of the night, and that's who he's looking for. We know in 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because it fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. So we see... All of his people that are carrying his bed are all afraid. They're all in fear because this is not godly love. As a matter of fact, the daughters of Jerusalem continue to speak and look at what they say in verse 9 and 10. Why, King Solomon made himself a chariot of the wood of Lebanon. He made the pillars of silver, the bottom of gold, the covering of purple, the midst being paved with love for who? For the daughters of Jerusalem. It's not for Jerusalem. It's for the daughters of Jerusalem. That's all he cares about. Now what's amazing is look at Amos chapter 6, verse 3 through 6. This portrays Solomon who's laying on his bed that everybody's carrying. Here he takes his bed out in the middle of the night. Now I'll tell you something. You who put far away the evil day, causing the rule of the violent 
to come near. Doesn't that sound like today? You who are resting on beds of ivory, stretched out on soft seats, feasting on the lambs from the flock. They're not feeding the lambs. They're feasting on the lambs. It sounds like a lot of our political leaders. And the young oxen from the cattle house, making foolish songs to the sound of corded instruments and designing for themselves instruments of music like David, drinking wine in basins, rubbing themselves with the best oils, but they have no grief for the destruction of Joseph. These are people that are only concerned for the best times for themselves. They don't care about what is going on in Israel. They don't care about what's going on with God's people. I mean, this is so plain to me. <clears throat> Look at Ezekiel 34, 10 through 12. This is what the Lord has said. He said, look, I'm against the keepers of the flock. Wow. I am going to search and see what they have done with my sheep and will let them be keepers of my sheep no longer, and the keepers will no longer get food for themselves. I'm going to take my sheep out of their mouths so they may not be food for them. For this is what the Lord has said. Truly I, even I, will go searching and looking for my sheep as the keeper goes looking for his flock when he's among his wandering sheep. So I will go looking for my sheep, and I will get them safely out of all the places where they've been sent wandering in the day of clouds and the black night. This is why Messiah came. He came to gather nothing but the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But look, how, look what the, God says to the shepherds that aren't feeding the flock. Now, what does the bride say? The bride is finally maturing, okay? And she says to the daughters of Jerusalem who just love King Solomon, she says in chapter 3, verse 11, you go forth, O you daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals, not espousal, espousals, he buried a thousand ladies, and in the day of the gladness of his heart. In other words, seeing is saying to the daughters of Jerusalem, you can have Solomon, I've got the shepherd. But now what happens? Now the shepherd jumps in and look what he says now because he's finally maturing. He says, behold, you are fair, my love. You are fair and you have dove's eyes. Remember earlier he said you have the eyes of a dove and not like a hawk or an eagle. And he says, you have dove's eyes within your locks. Your hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing, where everyone bears twins and none is barren among them. Your lips are like a thread of scarlet. Your speech is comely. Your temples are like a piece of pomegranate within your locks. Your neck is like the tower of David built for an armory, whereon there hangs a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Your two breasts are like two young rows that are twins, which feed among the lilies. He's actually feeding among the lilies. He's there helping. All right, can you imagine? Here he is. I'm going to give you a picture of what he just described. Here she is. Ta-da! Her nose is like the Tower of Lebanon. Her neck is like an army, you know. Her hair is like a flock of goats. <laughs> Honey dropping off her tongue. Now you know what she really looks like. All right, but with that said, get ready for next week. We're going to look at this in more detail. But I hope as I'm teaching this, you're getting a more real picture of what it's really trying to say because this is the one book that is so mistranslated, misspoke, taught on uh, throughout the church. But can you see what it's really about? It's all about the bride maturing, working the harvest. All she's been doing now is falling asleep, falling asleep, falling asleep. But there's going to come a point where the bride matures and that's where we're at prophetically right now. Prophetically. We are at the point where all of a sudden the, uh, the bride is going to mature and we're going to want to get to work. Does that make sense? All right, let's stand and pray.